ready. Whew, I haven't, I haven't told this story in a minute. I don't think I've ever told this one on stream before. So today, I wanted to talk to you guys about the case of Sarah Verkaterin. Like I said, if you missed me saying it earlier, this is a case that stuck in my head for years when I first heard about it. And I just, ah, it, it just, I, it just, it really bothers me because I, it's sad, yeah. Sarah Verkaterin is the daughter of Dawn Marie Verkaterin. She's the mother of, I think, four children. Um, and she was married to a guy named Larry back in 1999. They met through work and they lived in Florida. They marry about two years after they, pretty much two years after they meet. And then they relocate to a place called Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And that's where his parents lived. So Dawn brings along her youngest daughter. Sarah Verkaterin, because they were very, very close. They were kind of like really good friends when she was growing up. And Sarah was really kind of popular in high school around when she was like 13 or 14 years old. But then she starts meeting some new friends. These new friends, they're all drinking, smoking, cigarettes, marijuana, all that stuff. But it all leads up to Sarah doing heroin for the first time at 17 years old. So Sarah, unfortunately, starts doing heroin by the age of 17, and she's even completed a stint in rehab already. The issue with this is that, and I, <laughs> I, I'm telling you guys this because I need you to understand what that drug does to you. So for somebody that's clearly numbing their emotional pain with alcohol, marijuana, pills, cigarettes, all of that stuff, they're pushing something down because they don't feel good in their day-to-day -day life. But what ends up happening when Sarah starts taking heroin at 17, she reaches a high that she will never have again, ever. Because heroin is physiologically one of the peaks of what you can feel for about 60 seconds and then it goes away. Another problem too that we find in addicts, especially when they're much younger, is when you get older, like when you're, let's say you're in your late 20s, or maybe it just depends what your responsibilities are. You might have a job where you're working five days a week on a schedule. You might have a significant other that would not deal with your addiction. You might have children that you don't want to let down. So when people are a little bit older, it can be incredibly difficult to let go of addictions, but they have responsibilities that push them in that direction. When you're a 17 year old that has nothing to lose and you try heroin, you will keep doing heroin and you will not stop doing heroin. By this point, Sarah's already completed rehab at 17. Here, Sarah, I'm so sorry guys. So then in 2011, Sarah actually ends up having a child. So here's a picture of Sarah, her mother and their son and her son. Dawn, so, so, so excited to be a grandmother. Her kids are pretty much growing up. Sarah's the youngest. Now she's got a new baby in the house. And Dawn is giving this kid grandma's love. She loves this kid to death. But unfortunately, her daughter is hooked on drugs. So for Dawn, this kind of starts a really big issue because she doesn't want her grandson to be left out alone. But then she also knows that Sarah is completely out of control at this point. So she tells Sarah that she can move back into her house under the conditions that she gets clean, gets a job, and we go from there. Sarah moves in with her mom, with her son, and everything's fine for a little bit. She ends up getting a job at like a local retail store. She's holding her job for a little bit. But something else I have to remind you guys of is Sarah is not paying rent. Sarah does not have responsibilities. And Sarah's making money. And what is she going to do with it? She's going to buy drugs. I don't know if you guys have ever dealt with an addict before, but addicts are incredibly good at lying and deceit. And they can and will do things that they would never normally do because they are physiologically dependent on a drug. Sarah starts stealing from her job. She starts stealing merchandise that she can try to sell later somewhere else, whether they be pills or something. She's stealing from the register. She's just stealing a little bit of petty cash on top of her paycheck so that she can do drugs. And then one day she gets caught. 
The shop owner tells Sarah, we know you're stealing. We've been watching you for a while. We need to look into your bag. We'll let you go under the condition that you pay back what you stole, and then we won't call the police. We we won't press charges, and you can just go home back to your mother. So they fire her. She pays it out. Okay. So the cops bring Sarah back home, and they tell Dawn that she's been let go. Nobody's pressing charges, but here's your daughter. After this, Sarah starts to have a really hard time because she has no money and she has a lot of free time on her hands and now she doesn't have any drugs. Dawn starts to get increasingly strict about her daughter's drug usage, won't even let her do marijuana in the house. Not about it. So what's happening now at this point is Sarah is starting to withdraw. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with the symptoms of withdrawal. But it is one of the worst things that people can go through. And really, it can only last three, four, five days, sometimes maybe 10 days. It starts off as a flu, and then it starts to transition into aches, pain, nausea, mood swings, general stress, agitation, and it gets worse, and it gets worse until the second or third day where the cravings really start to kick in. Because for an addict, their head's not in the right space. They're used to just being able to push a button and make all of their pain go away. And so for them to be experiencing the worst emotional, psychological, and physical pain, and to know that just a few steps away, they can smoke some dope or shoot something up and make it go away, oh, it's all they can think about. And on this night, on New Year's Eve in 2013, heroin was all that Sarah could think about. So she asked her mom if she could borrow the car. And Dawn knows, I'm not letting you borrow this fucking car. I know exactly what you're doing. You can't get any pills, you can't get any heroin, and you can't get any marijuana. What Dawn's trying to do is to protect her daughter, but all Sarah hears is you're gonna suffer through this withdrawal with nothing. And that's not gonna fly for Sarah. So Sarah knows where the keys are. She knows where the wallet is. She knows where the pin number is. And also she knows where a hammer is. So what Sarah decided to do in the midst of her heroin withdrawal rage was approach her mother with a hammer and she struck her. And the first thing that Dawn did when she dropped down and saw her daughter hitting her with a hammer was she said, oh my God, Sarah, take the keys, take the keys. I love you, I love you so much. And Sarah did not listen because she had gone too far already and she is in the midst of a rage. And she struck her mother again. And she struck her mother again while her mother yelled, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, take the keys, Sarah. And that did not matter. Sarah continued to strike her mother and when she saw that she was dying slowly, She put her hands around her neck and she strangled her for six minutes while she watched the life of her own mother that gave her birth and tried to protect her from her addiction drained out of her. And then, what did Sarah do after that? She took the keys, withdrew $600 from her mom's bank account, and went and bought a brick of heroin. She took her son, who was asleep in the other room, and they went to a motel. Sarah laid in that hotel room for two days shooting up heroin while her mother lay dead in the closet and her son was sitting there watching cartoons. That to me is the scariest part of the story. That she just laid in that hotel room for days shooting up heroin. So then after that, Sarah's out of heroin. She's already done all of the heroin. So she gets this bright idea as drug addicts do and she decides she needs more money to get more heroin. So first, she tries to rob a subway. Apparently, it was a failed robbery. I'm not really I'm not really sure what her plan was, but I can definitely picture the clerk telling Sarah, "Sorry, we don't have any money," and she just says "fucking leaves." So then, she goes to a bank. She hands the clerk a note while she's looking cracked out and she's got this big bag and the note just says, "I have a gun. Give me $500." That's it. So the clerk in training, just puts a couple hundred dollars in her bag. Sarah leaves, like, here we go, time to go get some more heroin. The clerk calls the police immediately, and Sarah gets caught in minutes. 
When she's apprehended by the police, she immediately confesses to the robberies. She even tells the police why. She wanted some dope. But Sarah never mentions the murder at all. Sarah never mentions the murder when she's in custody. She never mentions it while her mom's body is decaying on the floor. What actually ends up happening is Dawn's work had seen that she hadn't been there for four days. Sarah had been using Dawn's phone to text people and try to act like she was okay. But when Dawn doesn't show up for work for three or four days and stops making excuses for it, they end up calling Larry, Dawn's ex-husband, to go to the house and check in on her. Larry ends up finding his ex-wife in the closet, beaten to death, bloodied, and she'd been laying there for, I want to say it was four days. After that, he ends up calling 911, reports it immediately. Sarah's still in custody. She gets questioned for her mother's murder and breaks down immediately. Just right off the bat. Because when you think about it, guys, this girl never hated her mother. She loved her mother. She was fighting a very, very, well, not even fighting, but she was suffering from a very, very serious disease, which is addiction that caused her some, like not to see clearly for a while. So Sarah's probably going through some withdrawals while she's here at the police station, but she confesses to everything immediately. This is her with her mugshot. She ends up pleading guilty to first degree murder. And at her sentencing, she actually says a lot of very remorseful things. We tried to find a clip of it, but she says, that was my mother. I feel like I should spend the rest of my life in prison because of what I did to her and I should not get out. I thought this was really interesting. It says, though a 2019 appeal of her sentence was denied, Sarah claims she has turned her life around and even speaks to fellow inmates about the dangers of addiction. She said, even if my story about drugs and heroin can help one person, my mother would be very happy. I believe that, man. I, I obviously, this is like, the crime itself is horrifying. It's fucking horrifying. But I've actually read some of the statements from Sarah afterwards and like, I, I can feel the remorse. And I mean, I'm not surprised because she killed her mom in a drug-fueled raid. Yeah, she, I mean, she has to be clean because she's in prison. So there's really no way you can use. And also, if you were using, one way that people end up quitting addictions is when they hit their rock bottom. When you kill your mom for heroin, that's your rock bottom. Even if she wasn't in jail, I, she might quit that shit. Yeah, dude, this one, this one really hurts. But I think it's a really super, super, super interesting one.